So, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, everybody had a good lunch, and thank you all for coming here. We have the second half of this day. Future fuels is our topic. In the morning, we had alternative fuels, and now we want to talk about the infrastructure. Is it still existing? What is needed? Who is financing it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, I have a lot of guests. Uh, it's the biggest panel I think we have here at the Blue Innovation Dock this week. Um, I like to call them one by one, and they take their seat. Um, just to inform you, this seat here is my seat. Don't take this one. Um, first of all, please, uh, Lana Sissing, manager yachting at Good Fuels. Lana, the only woman sits in the middle. That would be nice. Um, then I have Ismail Ertok, member of the European Parliament. Good afternoon. Mehdi Hoshin, correct, acting head of unit European Commission. Roberto Perocchio, president Asso Marinas, the Italian Marina Association. Carl Oscar Tienström, CEO and co-founder of Fossil Free Marine. Alex Bamberg, CEO of Aqua Superpower, and Jose Luis Fayos, technical uh -oh. consultant, Behind you. Uh, specialized in marina <laughs> development. Hair blocking me again. <laughs> Thank you all. Good afternoon. Massimo. So, non non mi fanno mettere le slide. All okay. How is the show so far? Good. Yeah. A lot of people here. Um, we had a good experience throughout this show. If everybody describes himself a little bit, one, two, three minutes, I don't care, but uh, you are better than me in this. Um, so everybody in the audience and online knows who is on stage here. Uh, ladies first, of course. Uh, Lana, please. Hello, welcome, uh, thank you. Um, Lana Sissing from Good Fuels, uh, based in Amsterdam. Uh, a little bit about Good Fuels. We are a market maker and a, a global pioneer uh, for sustainable fuels. Uh, what I will predominantly talk about today is uh, renewable diesel. Uh, you may have heard uh, HVO, hydro treated vegetable oil. Perhaps just give me a little, if you've maybe even heard the word, maybe you've heard the term drop in fuel. Um, Good Fuels is headquartered in the Netherlands. Uh, we also have offices um, in Singapore. We operate in Norway and Gibraltar as well. I'll pass it over. Thank you very much. Uh, Ismail, maybe we go from the list now. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me, Ismail Erzog from the European Parliament. Uh, I'm a member of the Transport Committee and uh, the rapporteur for the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, which deals mainly with the um, uh, infrastructure for the alternative uh, powertrains in the future. I was also a shadow rapporteur for the legislation before, which was the AFID, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. And you see from a directive, it moved towards a regulation, and this is, in my eyes, uh, more binding, it's a good step, and thanks to the European Commission, they proposed it from the beginning on as a regulation and not anymore as a directive. Okay, we go deeper into this probably to explain it yes. for people who are not so familiar with it. Uh, Mehdi? Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. So I'm Mehdi Ossin from the European Commission, the department uh, which is in charge uh, of the legislation that uh, actually applies to recreational craft, both for safety and for pollutant emission. And uh, before that, it's very good that we have also the presence of Mr. Ertug because I was working in the mobility unit of uh, the Commission working uh, also on uh, the issues such as electrification, batteries, and also safety, but for the mobility, uh, mobility ecosystem. So I will try also to bring today my uh, also experience with uh, another, the automotive sector. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, Roberto is yeah. next here on my list. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I represent uh, 90 Italian marinas. It's uh, the Italian Marine Association, which is part of the uh, Italian Marine Industry uh, Association. And of course, we are very interested in the energy transition. We want to be prepared. Many of our members are ha working hard on, on, the, on the subject. We've been studying the uh, new uh, future options and we will be very glad to discuss uh, it with, uh, with our colleagues. Okay. Thank you, and uh, I have to be neutral, but I'm uh, very uh, glad Carl Oscar is here because uh, he has a, I think, very interesting product to, to explain. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Philip, for uh, reaching out and inviting me. Um, yeah, obviously, um, uh, I run a company called Fossil Free Marine. So we develop uh, fuel infrastructure solutions uh, that enable the transition over to more sustainable fuels. Um, our first commercial scale product, and I'm a marketing guy at heart, so it, it pains me not to have a, a PowerPoint to, to show it, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's the world's first fully unmanned mobile uh, floating fuel station. Uh, so in layman's terms, we've essentially taken uh, everything you'd find on an unmanned automotive station, and we've placed that on a warship. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a floating pontoon made out of the same kind of composite that you would build a warship or a submarine out of. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly advanced uh, piece of kit uh, developed together with uh, D&V, Norske Veritas. Uh, so it's, it's certified like a ship. It complies with the same environmental and safety standards like an automotive station. Uh, and essentially that unlocks a part of the value chain. Uh, here before lunch we had uh, Neste talking about the, their renewable diesel. And, uh, and their entrance uh, into the, the fuel industry kind of shifts the, the paradigm in a way, if you like, uh, especially in the terms of the bargaining power of the suppliers. So Nesta can place quite far-reaching demands on, on the infrastructure uh, to allow distribution of their fuels, and we unlock uh, that. So that's what we do. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And uh, Alex, just here, far end. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Alex Bamberg, a CEO of Aqua Superpower. Um, Aqua Superpower deploy high-speed DC and AC chargers globally and focusing on the marine, coastal and inland waterways. Uh, our background comes from a very successful uh, operator of CPOs. Um, within the UK, we were the second largest owner operator of several thousand chargers in the UK. And uh, early on, you you could describe us as a pioneer in the space uh, where we built all our own uh, software and cloud-based systems, payment systems, and how indeed that evolved into paying by kilowatt or the service itself. Uh, we choose best-in-class hardware and modify it for the marine segment. And we're here today to talk about that and understand that this is a, a very important subject to speed up the transition away from liquid carbon fuels. And Jose, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jose Luis Fallos. I represent ANEN, that is the Spanish Marine Trade Association, with around 800 companies across the country, most of the marinas and yacht clubs. Uh, we are also proud members of EBI, European Boating Industry, and uh, also I, I, I work as a marina consultant so with some experience on marine operations and, and energy for marinas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, this morning was about uh, alternative fuels, e-fuels, and I learned myself uh, a lot um, because we had some, from the commercial shipping, some, some good experts here. Uh, but it seems the, the problem is uh, the infrastructure. So, okay, the fuel is there, but how can we put it on the boat? Who will do it? Um, um, they said, okay, it's reliable for the engine, etc. So this is set, but the infrastructure. Um, and this is a question maybe to, to different countries here. Maybe uh, Roberto starts. Uh, how yes. is the uh, yes, situation uh, in Italy? Yeah, I'm glad to get deep, deeper into the subject, because if we take a marina, uh, the, the future means uh, multiple options, because you have the electric option, 
you have the methanol option, we've been discussing it with San Lorenzo and other super yachts builder. You have the hydrogen option, because I mean, uh, the goal of the uh, European Commission is to reach uh, 20 million tons uh, uh, production of hydrogen, of green hydrogen, by 2030, which means that, that hydrogen will be less expensive uh, than it is today, and uh, we will be able to discuss uh, the evolution of this kind of, uh, of fuel. But, but of course, if we take a marina, on one side you need uh, more power, more electric power, and green power. Okay, so many of our members are working hard on one side to make solar panels. Uh, I would like to, to uh, thank the European Commission because uh, one of our members just, uh, is just making uh, a 500 kilowatts uh, solar uh, panel installation with uh, a cost of uh, 400,000 euros, of which 80% subsidized by uh, next generation EU through the Italian government. So uh, uh, we see uh, the mechanism working in order to deliver some uh, uh, stimulus, some financial uh, support to the marinas who are willing to transform uh, the, the, their, their structure, their infrastructure. On the other side, of course, uh, uh, solar power is a nice thing, but we need also more direct power, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's why the fast charge system is very important. Many of our marinas already, uh, let's say, made agreements with the Aqua Superpower in order to have a fast charge installation with 150 kilowatts, which means that having an installation which is independent from the system of the marina, because uh, Aqua Superpower provides uh, all the structure and, uh, and the connection to the grid, uh, giving to the customer who wants to make uh, a charge in 20, 40 minutes, uh, the opportunity to pay with a credit ca card on, a, on an independent base. On the other side, you have more and more customers having small electric boats, uh, which simply make a, a slow charge, which means they just uh, use the ordinary pedestal of the marina to charge slowly the boat during the week in order to have it ready uh, during uh, the weekend. Uh, for example, it's uh, a fascination to see in some of our marinas the silent yachts, uh, which is one of the sponsors, catamarans, which uh, charge uh, uh, their batteries with the sun during uh, the week uh, so that uh, the customer is ready to start uh, during the weekend uh, for a tour of uh, nearly 100 miles of, uh, uh, to, to, to several destinations. But of course, such a boat will probably need also an additional support from the OPS, from the online, online power shore uh, supply, okay? The online uh, power, power supply on land, sorry. And, uh, and this means uh, the marina needs to be ready to provide enough support to, to, to this kind of boats. Okay. Then, of course, you have uh, the, the, the biggest nightmare, which uh, are the new fuels, uh, not the, uh, the biodiesel, They're which is... not a nightmare. No, no, not a nightmare <laughs> at all. Biodiesel, biodiesel is not a nightmare at all. But if we talk about methanol and if we talk about hydrogen, we don't know exactly what we are facing. I can only tell you that, uh, uh, for example, in my city, in Venice, in Italy, we now have the second Italian uh, hydrogen uh, fuel station. And it's <coughs> perfect because uh, it's fully automatic. Uh, you just need to use your, your credit card. Uh, you need five minutes to uh, pump the, the gas under pressure inside uh, a car. Uh, at the moment, it's a, it's a car um, uh, uh, fuel station, but it will be expanded to boating because uh, in the lagoon of Venice, there are many experiments going on in order to provide uh, new technologies uh, also to the professional and leisure boats. Okay? So, uh, that, uh, here we step into the field of regulation, because uh, at national level and uh, European level, we need to be quick in order to clarify uh, which are the safety rules uh, that a marina should adopt uh, in order to have uh, a methanol tank or a hydrogen tank. From the point of view of uh, practical solution or technology or, uh, or, let's say, safety, there's no particular complication as, as far as we could see. But, uh, you know, uh, the rules need to be made. We had the same problems with the electric boating rules because uh, until uh, a couple of years ago, 
in my country, for example, it was impossible to have a boat with only an electric engine. Uh, the electric engine could only be conceived as an auxiliary engine. Okay? Uh, and nowadays, we made very quickly the rules in order to allow electric boats to uh, proceed just on electric power. Okay? So this is a, a quick overview, and then yeah. we will get back to the subject. Yeah, but the, uh, you represent 90 marinas. Yeah. How many of them are already thinking ahead this way? Because they all, all of them, all, all, because uh, we um, understand that, uh, let's say, green boating uh, and especially silent boating uh, can be a big advantage for the industry because if you provide the opportunity to a customer to uh, sail at speed uh, with the same sensation of a, of a sailing boat, uh, it's, uh, it's really a revolution. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the situation in um, Jose in Spain, how is it? Because you have many members as well. Huh? Yeah, it's more or less the same. I fully agree with Roberto. Infrastructure is the big challenge. We can see at, the, at boot that there are so many options for uh, alternative fuels boats, but not so many for infrastructure. I would like to include it into the debate. One big problem we have in Spain, but probably also in Italy and other countries, that is that marinas, yacht clubs, they have limited time for the for running operations because of the lease hold. So sometimes if the time is going to the end, it's going, very it's going to be very difficult to pay for a uh, new infrastructure. Again, could be a, not a good opportunity for aqua, aqua superpower to mm, get the enough revenues for their investment because the lease hole is becoming to an end. So, uh, new marinas, new uh, projects needs to include this kind of services as a must because the time frame is not so short, it's quite long. Mm. So we need to be very active on that field. Yeah. Uh, then I'd like to bring in Ismail or Mehdi. I don't know who is answering to this. If you want to plan a new marina, if you want to de develop your marina, what kind of funding can you have? What is the procedure? What is your idea on this? Yes, um, the European Commission, as I said, they uh, proposed the so-called AFIR. I want to mention this once again, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation. What's the purpose there? The purpose is um, the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure, need to be alternative. That does mean need to be electric. And uh, this is that what we can offer as regulator, as European Parliament together with the Council. Um, and the onshore power supply, for example, that has been mentioned already for the moment. But when we, when, we, when we talk about alternative infrastructure, I think most of the people, they think about cars and trucks and vans. But this is not the only one. We have also uh, emissions, in particular in maritime area and also in aviation. And also for this kind of uh, modes, you need some, some infrastructure, as I said, which is alternative. And for this, the European Commission, they made the proposal to deliver our onshore supply, electricity supply, also for ships, not for every ship. So we have, um, uh, there, is, there is a limit where the uh, ships are included or within the uh, regulation. And um, so this onshore power supply will be done in the future, I hope, by the member states as soon as possible and as ambition as possible. And the European Union, they subsidize that with the so-called Connecting Europe facility, for example. This is a budget where the member states can get money out of it. And the framework and the, the, the yeah, the frame is uh, in our hands as regulator, and I'm the rapporteur for it, as I said, that goes also for the infrastructure on port level, or maritime port, also inland waterways, but not to forget, as I said, also maritime. This is in a nutshell that what we do in the European Parliament for the moment within the so-called trilogues. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, maybe just to, to complement, because indeed what is important <laughs> is that for the alternative uh, fuel infrastructure, you have to think about several modes, not just electric, not just hydrogen. Uh, it's also true that uh, for the time being, it does not cover marinas because uh, this was, I mean, it's true that we, we first uh, proposed something to the parliament and the council that would 
first address, you know, the, the one that consume a lot, so mainly, uh, you know, maritime ports. But what we expect is that uh, on the long term, of course, if you bring big uh, electricity capacity through the grid, through the maritime port, we also expect that there would be also positive spillover also on the marinas. Yes. And uh, also uh, what is also, what is also um, important is indeed uh, is to, um, and what that was done for uh, the uh, AFIR, is that at the same time we had the proposal, uh, we had the proposal also on alternative fuel. And I understand you may have discussed it this morning, but it has to go, of course, hand in hand. And, uh, but I, I'm positively uh, surprised that to, to hear what is going, uh, taking place already uh, in, uh, in Italy. And also, of course, of course, the, uh, Europe can help. But what we also uh, saw in certain sectors, and it was the case in automotive, is that very often the, the greening was also uh, promoted by local authorities when it was decided to have a low emission zone. And I think you don't need to have Europe for that. And, uh, and what we see, of course, now in all the big uh, European cities, you have this low emission zone for the cars. And I understand that it's also coming also, uh, also in certain area like lakes, uh, like uh, areas where you have already a lot of pollution. Local authority they can enforce this uh, legislation, and it has also I think also what I also like what you say about the noise because this is also what you can have yes, yeah. with certain power trains, also very. Uh, Quiet, uh, quiet uh, driving, or uh, let's say navi navigation. Navigation, indeed. Mm. Yeah. Please. Yeah, if if I can just build on what you've already said, I think that the um, there there shouldn't be too much of a focus on waiting for this infrastructure to come, whether it's electrification, whether it's hydrogen, methanol, ammonia. We don't know how these energy sources are going to work. Um, I think we all know that we, that we don't know that just yet. We are all working on it, which is brilliant, um, and that's a it's an option for in the long run. Um, I think with the current infrastructure that we're dealing with now, if you can supply fossil fuel, you can supply renewable and uh, renewable diesel. So there is a means to get us to this next point, um, and and that looks like biofuel, it looks like HVO for this sector specifically, but then we also talk about commercial shipping and crews in these bigger uh, vessels as well. So it's nice to, it's, it's fantastic that we're actually all thinking about that 5, 10, 15 year solution, um, but we can implement solutions now, today, tomorrow, uh, to take us to that next solution. Yeah, I have uh, two persons here for now. Yeah. So, um, Alex, uh, because you are, you told me you're coming from the automotive industry. Uh, um, I think you have lots of experience. Um, how uh, did it work there, and what do we have to do to be as fast as this industry? Yeah, I think there is a lot of learnings, and I think, I think what we all have to understand that e-mobility and the electric motor is very significantly simpler than a thermal or internal combustion engine. And not only is it 80% more efficient, it is also quieter as we also discussed. The bottlenecks come around with political and legislation issues, leasehold issues with the big investment, and also um, which has held up and is still holding up the automotive segment which is the landscape of the supply chain of new electronics, batteries, etc. So these are all restrictions. What we do know is the electric motor is pretty unbeatable as an efficient tool to push something along, be it vehicle, vessel, whatever it is. So I think uh, w with what we do, we, we fund our grid connection, we fund the capital infrastructure, and we run the systems from the cloud, as I said earlier. And the experience is, the consumers are ready to change. The, the cars have, have set quite an interesting benchmark and provided a lot of good education. Right. And uh, uh, the world, certainly in the sort of sub 20 meter market in recreational or commercial operations, particularly commercial operations, um, <clears throat> electric uh, works extremely well. Um, we talk to many powertrain and boat builders. We're 
We're partnering up with Delphia from Beneteau, uh, and this is a very strong relationship, and there are other boat builders as well we're, we're talking to. Um, and these partners are essential to create the confidence in the market as we transition to a cleaner, quieter, probably more powerful fuel, actually. So this is where we are, yeah. But how many of these did you install already, and where are your hurdles, where are your borders, what, is, what are your problems? Um, to do that, do more, I mean, like, tung, tung, tung. Yeah, so we've, we were incorporated to two and a half years ago uh, at that point uh, to now. We have circa 600 uh, work in progress contracts out globally. We focused initially in southern Europe and now we expand up to the northern European areas, very important for the Austrian and the German lakes, which are driving some of the legislation to change. And what happened in the car business, and we have to look, we ha we're lucky to have a book from the car business. And actually, if I can say, we helped write that book. And so it's quite interesting to learn. And when legislation becomes on our side for green initiatives and the cleaner environment, the market accelerates much faster. So in Holland or Germany with the lakes, and the inland waterways, this is definitely a target. The commercial areas of all boating where you have a dedicated duty cycle. So you can design the boat, the vessel to operate within that duty cycle. It uh, has a good return on the investment for those operators. The problems we have encountered um, is essentially, the main one apart from cost is probably the, which was mentioned earlier, the freehold versus leasehold versus concessionaire and because we need a long time in the ground to get the return on investment because we're essentially charging little money but the investment could be two or three four hundred thousand euros per installation so this is a barrier so we look to government to help with this potentially we have recently won in the UK two or three uh, grant assisted corridors of charges and this is what we want to look into in the European area as well. This is crucial. And this really accelerates the market. And, and it, we need to accelerate because people will not buy the boats until they see the charges. No charges, no boats. It is really that simple. So how do we get there quickly? Yeah, I mean, the legislation is, uh, it drives a bit the sales here in southern Germany because you cannot get a license for a boat with a combustion engine. If you buy electric, you can go immediately, then you get a license. Otherwise, you have to wait maybe 25, 30 years. Uh, someone dies or, I mean, will be inherited within the family. So this drives here the sales on these big Bavarian lakes. Um, is this something that has been, uh, is a topic in, in Brussels? I think, um the, the so-called chicken and egg problem is yeah. well known. So we had the same on roads when we talk, when we have spoken at that time about cars, for example. Remember the legislation back in 2013? Um, the industry said as long as no charge is available, we are not uh, willing to, to manufacture some cars and the other way around. But to a certain extent, and that was a little bit the, the, the mistake, I would say, in particular by the member states, um, they have watered down the legislation from 2013. And the watering down has led to a situation that we have lost six to seven years in, ex, um, in um, uh, deploying this kind of uh, infrastructure. And I don't want to make the same mistakes with the other modes right now. And that's the reason why I'm really grateful that the European Commission were so ambitious with the proposal. And we as the European Parliament, I would say we have even made that more ambition, ambitious. And um, now, once again, uh, occurs almost every time and always that the member states are watering down the ambition level. And, uh, but the watering down weakening it is not the solution because we need, as uh, you said, we need the infrastructure there and we have to decarbonize in particular this mobility sector as in total. 
and um, the chicken and egg has been broken through by the European Parliament. We clearly said we expect on road, on rail, uh, on, on maritime, on aviation, these and these steps, for example, in order to go uh, forward with this kind of infrastructure, in order to avoid these kind of uh, chicken and egg problems also um, in the maritime area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please, Roberto. Uh, I would like to add the fact that, uh, for example, in, in Italy nowadays, but I think in, in all the other European countries, whenever there is an issue of uh, concession renewal or prolongation, uh, you get more points uh, if you are investing in uh, the energy transition. Okay, if you are uh, putting solar panels or if you are, uh, let's say, installing any kind of tool or, or tank or whatever that can be functional to this kind of path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, may, maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, indeed, I think what al is also important is indeed legislation important, but it takes time because it takes time also to build consensus. But we have also uh, to see also other ways. I mean, we mentioned, you know, the local regulation that can be a strong drive. Uh, when you have, of course, the type of regulation that you can only go electric if you go on certain lake but you have also the national incentives, uh, and I think sometimes with EU money, uh, that can also help uh, to a large extent to uh, finance the extra cost to go green. And it's not only about money, but it's also about sometimes about permitting, because um, what I've seen also for the, uh, the deployment of the um, uh, recharging infrastructure, and I'm sure you experience this, is that in certain countries you can have also long waiting time, not for the authorization to, to build the station, because sometimes, you know, it can be two weeks, but also long waiting time to have the uh, authorization to have the capacity from the grid. Exactly. Correct. Yep. And, right. and I think this is also something that needs also, should not be underestimated. So it's also the permitting that needs also to improve. I think, okay. yeah, um, this is a key point. So between the, uh, the, the concession and the freeholder, there's, this is a debate on how much time one can invest and get your uh, return on investment. And the other big problem is the grid connection and the time it takes to get the correct grid connection. Uh, in the, it, what we lobbied for for many years was that the governments would actually pay or contribute to the underground element of the infrastructure because this is a national asset potentially so and what happened probably back in 2016 17 in the in in the uk anyway the government realized that the the growth of the e-mobility market on in the cars it became a critical infrastructure not a side issue it suddenly suddenly there were police cars suddenly there was critical meals on wheels suddenly there was ambulances these things all needed charging. So there was a priority given to supporting this grid connection. And this, as we transition to this volume and scale perspective in the marine, uh, this, this will become for harbour masters, for ferries, for communication, it all becomes critical. And that's why we have to prioritise this. It's not, it's not a difficult piece. It's, it is not like trying to move hydrogen around. This, if you think electricity is a problem, take a look at hydrogen as an <laughs> infrastructure challenge. So this is uh, something we, we can solve, but we all need to talk and accelerate. Yeah, yeah, Roberto, and then i like to hear uh, um, your story because it's very interesting. Yes, Roberto. Oh, just very quickly, I just wanted to stress uh, the fact, of course, that uh, according also to the British Carbon Trust, which made a, a very deep analysis of, of all the potential future of the branch and so on. Uh, of course, uh, the, the impact of boats is very modest because uh, we know that uh, the average use of a boat engine uh, worldwide is 50 hours a year, okay? Because uh, the boat is a tool that you use to move to one point to the other and then stop and relax uh, and enjoy the nature and so on. But, but anyway, um, marinas uh, also have the problem of providing uh, electricity on site uh, with generators, okay? So uh, generators are something uh, sometimes emer emergency generators or also generators which provide uh, additional power in, in certain situations. 
And what is very new n nowadays is also the fact that you can have uh, hydrogen or methanol fuel cell generators. And that's also an interesting subject for marinas because uh, you can nowadays buy uh, a generator which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a two meters box with inside uh, methanol tanks which are liquid and uh, you don't have any problem of transportation or, or uh, um, hydrogen uh, b b bottles uh, which uh, uh, with the material that flows into a fuel cell and produces uh, the electricity you need uh, and all the power you need uh, without making any noise. Okay? So this is a, a new border and a new, uh, let's say, goal that we are trying to, to reach. Because one, uh, sometimes you, you change uh, the generator into a biodiesel, biodiesel generator, or you can buy a fuel cell generator. And uh, I wanted to stress the importance of the fuel cells because many pe a few people nowadays uh, understand uh, how a fuel cell works. It's a different mentality because you shift from uh, a combustion engine with a lot of mechanisms inside uh, to a comb because it's just a chemical comb which splits uh, the, the, the molecule uh, of, uh, of uh, methanol or hydrogen into a different uh, uh, product without releasing any pollution and uh, provides the energy to the electric engine. And this kind of flow is uncomplicated, direct, uh, and produces all the power you need. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Karoska, um, we had a very two minutes uh, in advance here before we started. Um, your story is already 10 years. 10 years development I, time, yeah. Yeah, and I'm... 20 years in this business, not easy to impress me, but when I looked at your website, um, I was impressed. Yes, the website describe isn't very, what you're doing. The website not the isn't website very impressive. Is no. state of the art, <laughs> but the product is, yes. No, but I mean, I, I think it's important to bear a couple of things in mind. I mean, um, first of all, I, I think, um, I'm an, like I said, I'm an old marketing guy, so, and I, I spent 12 years at Samsung trying to convince people that our latest phone was the best thing since sliced bread, right? And I think we as humans, especially men, I think, pardon, love technology. So we, we, we're super into the latest technology and think that's going to re revolutionize everything. And I think when I got into sustainability uh, a few years ago, uh, what struck me is, is that a lot of people are really hooked on one technology, uh, either because they work in it and, and are paid to do it, uh, or they've fallen in love with it. Uh, and I think we need to have a, a much more technology neutral approach and look at every single application, uh, every single geography, uh, every ty type of, of use education, uh, and look at what technology suits that. Uh, and the boating, boating world is very, very different. Like Roberto said, the average usage time of a boat is 50 hours a year. Uh, in Sweden, obviously, we have a pretty shitty weather, so the average is 19 hours per year. Uh, and the consequence is that a boat has a much, much, much longer lifespan than a car. So when you look at it from mathematical terms, that means that the replacement cycle is much, much longer. So if we are to really decarbonize the marine industry, we need to look at primarily existing boats uh, and look at how can we make th their climate impact much, much smaller. Then, and, and this is uh, one of my favorite expressions, or, or, or you, know, um, uh, you know, you need to be able to dribble a basketball and shoot dart at the same time. And that is really hard, but we need to, to keep several thoughts in our head at the same time. Uh, look at charging infrastructure. W we need to build that. Otherwise, we won't make people transition into electric boats. But we need to decarbonize the boats that are there. And that's where biofuels, renewable fuels, electrofuels are key. And yes, uh, we come to your product later. But <laughs> Jose, yeah? This is very, very important. And we have to be creative. Because you, you, could you imagine that every single boat on the water could be producing energy for the grid? with small solar panels that they usually use when they are anchor or small wind generators because you mentioned that boats are long yeah. but are used maybe once or 10 days per year or 11 or two weeks so i like to speak about pr production and consumption and maybe we can mix both words in one we, word we, we have to make mix them 
that's because, the only yes, way forward. Sometimes we produce yeah. when we are in the marina, and sometimes we consume when we are on the water. Yeah. So we have to think on out of the box yeah. sometimes and use in a very productive and efficient way the space, the 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 raw materials, the the products we have. Yes, I mean, uh, there are numbers. We have 6.5 million boats in the EU, EU and maybe 1 or 2 percent are electric boats. So um, you have to talk about the existing fleet and about, uh, yes, Roberto and Lana, about your solutions and about your solution, what is uh, very interesting because, I mean, if you want to refuel your boat sometimes, you, even here in Germany, is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, and this is something, I think, to, to bear in mind that um, the one difference when it comes to fuel infrastructure between the automotive sector and the marine sector is that we typically don't have the incumbents, the oil and gas companies. They like to call themselves energy companies nowadays, but, but, but you know, let's call them fuel companies. Um, they don't operate the, the marine stations. They operate the stations on land, and they, you know, they, they run them according to regulations, uh, and they're super, super risk-averse. Whereas the marine stations are old gas stations from the 60s and 70s. They don't comply with any of today's environmental and safety standards. And, you know, through different types of gray zones and loopholes, they still get to operate. Uh, and unless we upgrade and fix that infrastructure, we won't get the likes of Neste to start delivering uh, their, their fuels on a, on a scale. I just wanted to add the fact that, uh, if I remember well, uh, Aqua Superpower estimates that by 2030, we might have in the world uh, one million electric boats. It, it sounds like a very big number, but if you think of, uh, uh, let's say, substituting uh, an outboard engine, uh, a conventional one, with, a, with an electric uh, outboard engine with a sufficient pack of batteries, this can be quickly done on uh, uh, small boats uh, nowadays. And there's uh, another branch which is becoming very interesting, like it happened in the automotive industry. The uh, classic boats uh, retrofitting. So <laughs> you can, we, we already have uh, in France, for example, specialized companies which can make the retrofitting of a classic Riva, for example, into an electric boat, okay? With, uh, uh, let's say, an affordable, uh, let's say, investment. So uh, this might accelerate quite a while, uh, quite, quite, quite significantly uh, the, the path. If I may, very short, we need the help of regulators because in that case, boats need a post-construction assessment and this is hard and, and expensive to do it. So it's a very big opportunity to decarbonize the industry, yeah. but again, we need the help of regulators on that particular... To ease uh, the, the process. It's very good, it's very good, it's important. The wish is already noted. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Lana, you wanted something to add to Aska? No. No, no. It's about uh, the existing fleet. Yeah? It's no, it's exactly that. It's about the existing fleet. 6.5 million boats under 24 meters, an additional 6,000 boats above 24 meters, mm -hmm. 50,000 commercial vessels. That is a huge number when you think about it, and, and some of them will retrofit, absolutely. Um, but I think the greater percentage of these vessels are, are not going to, no. and we need these solutions that is, that's going to see them to the end of their life. Yeah. yeah. What do you, uh, Alex, what do you think, the uh, electric boats, what do you expect in numbers? I mean, in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Well, it's, a, it's quite hard to predict, um, actually, but I, we stick with this sort of 2030. It's quite hard to accurately talk about something that's five or ten years away. Um, and this is one of the problems in this industry of e-mobility or indeed any technology transfer where people look um, ten years forwards and go, we must be there today. That means you never start because you'll never get there with today's technology. So. What we try and look at is we, we take the best in space now and we plan for three or five years. And then we up knowing that that, that that equipment and that hardware is scalable. And this is important. So are there electric motors around? Are there battery control, control, control systems around? Yes, yes, yes. And all this stuff is here today. It works today. It's been proven today in automot automotive segments. In 2010 and 11, this hadn't been proven. This was, there were people like Nissan and Tesla 
pushing the envelope on building a parts bin full of suitable pieces of hardware to drive a vehicle. Today, it's a very different supply chain, but we need to ramp the scale. And of course, the world has had several problems with supply chains generally due to COVID and various other issues. And what's going on in Ukraine has obviously put lots of pressure on. But what, if there is a silver lining about Ukraine, it, it has actually created a focus on energy. And people get motivated, motivated by the environmental pressures, but a lot of people get motivated by money. And if they have to do without something to run their car, they look at the alternative. So they're being forced to look at the alternative. And uh, the government could do more in understanding and lobbying harder the energy, the so-called energy companies that provide fuel, liquid carbon fuel. And um, they are very pro-hydrogen and there's a balance. There's, there's no silver bullet for a lot of this transition. But governments seem to be a little too focused on hydrogen as a, as a fix-all. This is, this is not a green alternative today. We have to start, but it is not a scalable green alternative in the market of 20, 25 Big metre boats. Mm. If you want to go 2,000 miles across the ocean, this is a solution. For your day boat, for your short-term ferry, moving 10 to 150 people, you don't need to do 2,000 miles. So all of this piece is what we're working on, and you have to keep working on the, the latest technology. You have to have uh, the uh, risk, if you like, to invest and find people that are prepared to do that. But we need to bring the governments with us to create a, an advantageous landscape for the investors to actually step out and take the risk. Yeah. And we can deliver it, but it needs to be funded, and people need to understand that. But I'd also like to say just quickly that we all talk about the air quality and the climate change. And what we do know is that if you improve the, the, the emissions out of a tailpipe for air quality, you immediately accelerate the CO2 problem. And if you try and reduce the CO2, you accelerate the air quality problem. The fix is a, is a post-combustion set of technologies which are expensive to employ. And this is why the internal thermal engine on mass is, be, is coming to the end of its life. Not because it's not any good, but because it, there's a cost point for the consumer and it's not attractive. And the latest Euro 7 rules are actually enforcing this problem. So I think we have to say that, that it's about air quality, it's about climate, as we all know. But we haven't talked about the marine ecosystem. You know, when you spill fuel in the sea and the water, when you pump your bilge out, it is covered in carbon, uh, hydrocarbons, and this is not an attractive proposition for anybody, including the marine life. So I think this electric goes a long way in reducing massively the maintenance. It, it eliminates largely any of this carbon spill. And so all of this is very much in favor of electrification. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carlos Kai, and your your system coming back to this again. I mean, the first one is already floating, right? First is it one in is, Sweden? is uh, operational in Sweden. Yeah. So it, it's it's the world's first uh, fully unmanned autonomous mobile fuel station. Uh, so you deploy it like a dock. Uh, it operates like any other automotive station on land, um, and it complies with the same environmental and safety standards as you'd expect on land. Um, it even complies with the EU regulations for freshwater reservoirs. So you can put one in a lake. So hopefully. Later this year, we'll have the first one in downtown Stockholm uh, in the lake, which uh, serves all of Stockholm with fresh water. I think that will maybe tick the box and show people what we're doing. And all kind of fuels? And any, any, any type of fuel. I mean, I, I think somehow fossil-free marine gives the, gives the impression that we can only distribute you know, renewable fuels, which we can't, obviously. Uh, you, you can distribute any type of liquid fuel uh, from the fossil ones if, if, you know, uh, as part of the transition uh, all over to methanol uh, and e-fuels. Uh, so it has six tanks, which is an important uh, uh, element uh, because it, it can handle between four and six varieties at the same time. So I think the only thing we know for sure is that the, the complexity in the fuel industry is going to be bigger. Uh, un until we reach the point where everything is electric. But that's, and I say this with sadness in my heart, I, I don't think I'll be here to see that day in, in the marine sector because it's going to take that long before all boats are electric. But in the meantime, we need to supply all sorts of fuels 
because different boats will run on different things. Um, so it will be renewable diesel, it will be biodiesel blends for certain simpler engines, uh, it will be um, uh, biogasoline. Uh. We'll see, yeah. and, and please remember that boats on display today will be on the water 50 years later. Yes, we people will still be rubbing them, uh, working on them, uh, yeah, so loving the, them. The cycle is very long. And, and that's another thing, and I, I think we need to look at the, the, actually the footprint of a boat. I mean, mm. a lot of boats, I talked to a guy just, just before this panel who, who's into uh, fiberglass recycling, which is super interesting. Uh, and I think that's something we need to think about as it's well. It's tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's here tomorrow. But, but I mean, the, the, the footprint of a boat is massive. Uh, and you need to, 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 to weigh the, the, the pros and cons of, of replacing that boat, uh, or repowering it, obviously, if that's, if that's a feasible solution. But, but just replacing everything uh, you know, in, in the name of climate uh, isn't the obvious choice either, if you start crunching the numbers. Uh, so we need to take care of what's, what's already there, make it run on something better, uh, and then replace it when it becomes um, economically feasible or, or um, technology. And uh, if Ro 40 of Roberto's members want to order one station uh, uh, tomorrow? He has, he has my card. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, I jumped him after the panel yesterday because I, I didn't we know we were touched. sharing the panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, lady and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming. Very interesting panel. And I think we ticked some boxes. And I hope you exchange cards because I think it's a very... Very interesting group here Absolutely. today. Thanks for Thank having you us. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.